Hello and welcome to our summer NLU paper reading series. I'm Sandeep and I'm joined by my colleague Chase Roberts at Vertex Ventures. And our goal is to read a couple interesting papers every month and ask the authors for questions and clarifications and insights. Today we'll be discussing two papers, Colbert and DSP, both authored by Omar Khattab, who joins us here from Stanford University. Chiz, do you want to give a quick overview to, of yourself and then we'll pass the mic to Omar? That's okay. Let's go straight to him. He's the main event. Yeah, thanks for hosting me. So I'm a PhD student at Stanford, as you mentioned. I've been working with Matej Zaharia and Chris Potts, and we've been looking at retrieval, so improving the quality of search as well as <clears throat> leveraging the progress that's happening in retrieval to improve the quality of NLP systems, especially ones that try to uh, engage with knowledge intensive tasks, the things like answering questions or checking claims or helping users in conversations and things like that. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's dive right into it in that case. The overarching goal of of the Colbert paper as we read it is that bird based models which were state of the art in like late 2019 2020 are about a hundred or a thousand times more computationally expensive than prior models and kind of the raison d'etre of this paper is can we make them more computationally efficient is that right yeah so how do we just scale them up basically in, in dramatic ways and the architect and how do you get around the architectural constraints Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So can you set the problem up for us? There is a query and a document and you got to find the document close to the query, correct? Yes. So this is the problem of search. You have a, a document collection. Maybe you have millions of documents. And what you'd like to do is you'd like to leverage the representational power of large language models by the standards of, of whatever time you're in to encode these documents and encode these queries in some representational space that allows you to capture semantics, maybe capture some of the intent behind queries, and just generally have a highly effective search. And Colbert comes in a, or came in a context in which people were very reluctant to do a lot with emerging language model technologies at that time, like BERT, because we were just so used to bag of word representations. And traditional classical representations. And these are just a whole lot cheaper and simpler to reason about and to implement and to optimize. So what Colbert observes was because the documents are generally available offline, we get to encode them all separately from the queries. And we also, in fact, if we're clever about the way we do things, we can actually keep a whole lot of the representational capacity of BERT, which is where the more advanced parts of Colbert really come in. And so let's talk about that then, right? Like you, the paper sets up these two types of rankers, right? Representation focused and interaction focused. Describe them for us and what was the core intuition? Right. Uh, the standard sort of way BERT is trained and the way it's used by design typically is lever is to leverage its attention, right? So if you have a query and a document, kind of the most simple way conceptually to use it would be to say, okay, here's my query, here's my document. Please give me a classification score as to whether this document answers this query that I have. Um, the issue with that though is attention is expensive, but more importantly, attention is not really scalable. It's a Right. It's it's a computation that you have to conduct, and it has many layers, and it is quite complex. And you have to do it each time. And you have to do it each time. You and, have and, right. So if you have a million documents, which is actually a very right. small data set, in in many settings, you're not really no users are going to be interested in waiting for half an hour while you basically run your query over a million different times through your BERT encoder. Right. Uh, so this sort of other extreme of of thinking about this, which has since become a lot more popular when we were working on Colbert, it was somewhat niche 
especially in academic settings, was thinking of what's sometimes called buy encoders now, or just representation focused encoders is the is a traditional sure. old name. And what these do is you would take whatever encoder you have. Typically, it was not BERT, but now it is BERT models. And you would ask it to encode that document into a vector. So you have a vector space, and you basically are training uh, and then using that BERT encoder to spit out a single ve vector that could be a, a small, sparse, a small dense one or a large sparse one that captures the, the distribution of text that is in your documents. Right. Then you could index those and save them in nice data structures. When a query comes along, you can pass it through a different copy of BERT that will give right. you another vector, and then you can do similarity search, essentially. Right. So find right. vectors that are close to this vector right. uh, in, in that space. That's right. uh, and there is quite significant tension between these two extremes. So the interaction-based stuff is incredibly powerful, but it's also unscalable to the extreme for obvious reasons. The reason being, you got to apply this for every document, every, every document. document. Is, uh, yeah, exactly. So you basically don't benefit at all from the fact that these documents are available in advance. It's like okay. you're discovering them, you're seeing them for the first time for every query. Right. You cannot, they, there's no pre-computation. There no, there's no amortization, no pre-computation. Exactly. You keep encoding them each time. The issue with the... So this is exactly the issue that representation-focused paradigms avoid. But their issue is that now you got to find an encoder and a way to train it so that it's powerful enough to cram the meaning of this potentially long passage or long document into a single vector. So that one vector, which might have, I don't know, a thousand dimensions, needs to be able to match against any plausible potential question that you might have against that document, which is just a very a significant burden for these models. And so, which brings us to the core intuition, correct? Or what was the core intuition there? So the core Colbert. intuition of Colbert is, it's a much smaller ask, it's a much lower burden for the encoder if we ask it to encode meaning at the level of tokens. So say your query has 10 words and your document, one of your document has, I don't know, 200 words. If we ask it to produce 200 vectors for the document, just one vector for each token, and 10 vectors for the query. This is something that is a much easier job for it to do because basically the space of potential meanings for a given word just depends on the context, right? That's so there's right. like, if I have the word bank, there's only so many meanings it could have. Maybe it's a river bank. Maybe it's a, the financial institution. And then maybe it could take into account to some extent my... Uh, other subtle elements of the context, it's a bank that is one I operate with or something, but that's about it. And that's a much smaller burden for on, on the encoder. So that burden then of matching, of trying to find a similarity or estimate similarity between queries and documents could be shifted into some scoring mechanism that says, now I have a bag of vectors on the query and a bag of vectors on the document side. And I need to figure out how to reduce these two bags together into a single score. So that's what we basically spend the time thinking on the Colbert side. Got it. And so that is what you guys talk about in figure three, right? You've got this like query encoder and doc encoder, and then you're trying to create bags of embeddings and which are normalizing and then matrix multiplying. Yes, exactly. So the way Colbert works is that we use BERT in a way that's actually quite similar to the way it's pre-trained, which is it's going to emit a vector on top of each of the input tokens. It's an encoder. Right. That's what right. it likes to do. And then we're going to project these vectors into a very small dimension. And the reason we can get away with that is that, again, it's not trying to capture that much. It's just saying, hey, here is this word in its context. A very easy job in general. And we've seen that you could actually make the dimension of these vectors really small. I think the paper goes all the way down to 24 dimensions and things like that, and wow. still preserve quite a bit of quite a bit of quality. And, Sorry, go ahead, Chase. Yeah, just one one question here. You talked about the ranking mechanism. You chose the maxim operator. Can you talk about like why you chose that one and what other ones you considered? Yeah, yeah. So this is in fact where maybe the deepest 
insight I'd say in the original Colbert paper was. So this is inspired by the things that work well in traditional IR. So in traditional IR, even though you're working with these bag of word representations, so not, so not bag of vectors, just bag of actual words, you generally don't still don't want to score every document that has one or more of the terms. You basically want to do something that's called pruning. And pruning in search is all about if you could internally prove in your system that some documents cannot possibly have a high enough score, then you ideally don't want to pull them out and score them and do anything with them. You don't want to touch them. The way we designed the Colbert scoring function was to say, our input for scoring is two matrices, two bags of vectors. And intuitively, what we have in the query is a bunch of words, and a document is relevant to this query, essentially if and only if, for most terms in the query, there is a similar contextual match on the document end. And so what we do is we take every word in the query, we find the closest vector to it in this embedding space on the document side that gives us a, a score, a partial score. Right. We repeat this however many times are needed for the words in the query. Right. And then we just sum up these, these partial scores. Uh, and this gives us basically a, an average of how well is this query contextually captured in this document. The reason, this, the reason we chose that is addition and maximum are very nice mathematically in that we can actually now on the implementation side, so even though on the scoring side, this holistically captures the document and holistically captures the query, on the actual mecha mechanical scoring side, we get to decompose the way we implement this. We get to say, hey, this is just, if you have 10 tokens on the query end or 10 vectors, this is just 10 independent nearest neighbor searches. And nearest neighbor, which relies on max, is something that is an incredibly mature operation where basically we can skip any unpromising candidates very quickly. And so we're going to say at a very high level for every vector in the query, I just want to find the close, maybe thousand vectors in all documents. And I'm going to repeat this 10 times. And this dramatically shrinks the sorts of documents that we have to consider for any farther kind of refinement of the score, basically the summation component. Ah, uh, that's super cool. So what do these data structures look like in your implementation? I would love to hear a little bit about that, right? From a systems perspective, so if people want to implement it today, what is a good way to go about it? The thing that makes Schoolbear a bit different from most other retrieval methods is that it has its own <clears throat> encoder, that's normal, but it also has its own infrastructure for search. Um, and when we built it initially, we built our own infrastructure around the face library from Facebook, which is a very kind of nice, highly scalable and easy to use library for nearest neighbor search. So right. face like other libraries and now, you know, like basically dense vector search solutions are, are everywhere. I guess they're called embed uh, vector, vector databases. Yeah. Vector databases. Yeah. That's a new name as far as I can tell. What these would do and, and face here is a replaceable solution, but it's, it's a good one. What FACE did initially when we relied on it was it allowed us to index all vectors on the document side. And it, as far as it was concerned, it's a flat, it's a flat index, meaning, meaning it has no notion of the hierarchy that many of these vectors come from one document and the others come from other documents. It doesn't have a notion of that. It's just, here's a bunch of token level vectors. And then when we have a query, you could say, okay, I have 10 different queries because you have one vector for each of those. And I want the nearest neighbor for each. And then on the PyTorch side in, in the original Colbert implementation, we did our own sort of farther scoring. The key contribution of face here was to say, if there is a document that is that has not a single token that is close to any of our query tokens, then it won't even need to register into our farther PyTorch layers of scoring. Got it. Got it. That makes, got it. And in terms of the queries and the, the documents, right? Like how would you tie this back, I guess, then to the sort of the architectural or scaling constraints of retrieval augmented search and how would I mean, today, 
with vector databases, et cetera, available. Have you guys experimented it with with any of these sort of modern dense vector search systems? And that's a great question. So the way to tie this back is to say the problem we started with was that there were two extreme methods of scoring. Either you commit to being unscalable, but you get a lot of rich interactions. And interactions right. are always fine green. You know, those are what the tokens are being able right. to see each other. Right. Or you commit to no fine grained interactions, right? Just a single vector representation that has to encode everything, right. but is very scalable. And what Colbert says is actually you get to have both. So we are able to have highly scalable search because we've decomposed the problem into these ma summation of maximums, and these are very easy to, uh, to scale. But we're actually still scoring things contextually at the level of tokens that are able to interact with one another. Mm -hmm. As for how this sort of fits into the world of vector databases, um, so we're actually no longer using face as a key construct or a key component in Colbert. What we have now, and this is in a paper called Plaid with co-authors here at Stanford, particularly with my colleague Keshev. So this is our own custom infrastructure with its own C++ kernels for scoring specifically for Colbert. And it takes into account the fact the multi-vector nature of our scoring. So this makes things dramatically faster. And I'm sure many of the vector databases now are quite competitive, but to my knowledge, only Vespa has first-class support for multi-vector representations. And so everything else, if you were to use it, you can use it, but it will have to essentially be a you're going to be building a wrapper around it in the sense that it will deal with single vectors and you will have to extend it. things together. Yeah, exactly. You have to extend, you have to extend it to multi-vectors. Awesome. So, so think, thinking about like the stack itself, like which parts of the stack are modular and which ones are pr proprietary? Could you, you met, you started to talk about being able to sub in other vector databases, but are there other things that you, know, you could sub in in using Colbert? That's a great question. So Colbert, at the end of the day, so you could think of Colbert as two things. You could think of the artifact that we released, and this is a full stack as far as search is concerned. Obviously, search is just, a, it's just right. one small part of, the, of a larger pipeline in general. So you could use it out of the box like that. But you could also think of Colbert as the key idea of being able to do what we call late interaction between fine-grained representations. Uh, along, along that sort of spectrum, what you have are a bunch of modular components. So there is the encoder, and the encoder is just a BERT model or some other language model that's trained to take in a piece of text and spit out a bag of vectors. That's a very modular, that's a highly modular component. There's also the search stack, and there you could be very modular, but the question is, the more modular you are, you might be leaving some end-to-end -end optimizations. But for the longest time, Colbert was built as a modular wrapper around a single vector engine, which is face. So if that is a stable pipeline that you have, you can go quite far with this. And I actually can't miss to mention here that Google has this recent XDR paper that builds on Colbert late interaction, where their entire goal was to reduce Colbert scoring into 99% of the work being done on the vector similarity search component. Mm. So that's a very nice paper that they released, uh, that they released recently. Unfortunately, there's no open source code. And so we have some efforts on maybe thinking about including some of that into our own, but it, it's a, it's a very cool idea. Even if you haven't published it yet, are there, have you tried other encoders and noticed like any difference in performance, like given the specific use case? We have looked into that for a bit. We don't have, I think, papers on that. There, there is a nice, I've seen a nice reproducibility paper at SIGIR. The paper itself is not publicly available, but there's a couple of figures from the authors. And so this is from the University of Glasgow. And it seems from their plot, and it just is our experience. So maybe I'll speak about our experience more, more, more so, that it's really hard to outperform BERT base as an encoder for, for working with these models. Working with larger encoders gets you gains. So XTR, for example, which is a Colbert model, scales to a T5XX large encoder, which has 11 billion parameters, but they're only working with half of it, the encoder side. 
the gains are not too dramatic. So the gains from scaling are like, I think they see maybe four point from a huge increase in the number of parameters. So it seems that the Colbert scoring function is, like I said, it, it really unburdens the encoders to such an extent that you can actually work with very small and efficient encoders. And that's obviously quite desirable. Yeah, of course, because then it says something about just like being able to use this in the real world and kind of the hardware and processing constraints you end up with, which which does bring us to some extent to, to Colbert v, v2. So yeah, the, the late interaction retrievers or this model is a much more efficient one, but they do cause the models to become huge. And so with Colbert v2, you're attempting to solve this. So can you talk a little bit about the innovation here? Yeah. So when we released Colbert, let's say V1 or the original Colbert, the biggest kind of, every project has a bottleneck, right? So the biggest bottleneck in Colbert V1 was the in, the index size, the storage that you had to use for the documents was about 10 times bigger than standard vector representations. If you're working with like DPR or ANSI or like ADA embeddings from OpenAI or others. It was around 10 times bigger. Um, so in Colbert V2, we basically resolved that. We made it around 10 times smaller than it used to be. Six to 10, depending on your choice of parameters, choice of, of, of settings. And the key insight there was we just went all in on the hypothesis that these vectors really aren't trying to capture that much. The magic is happening in their interactions. And so we actually are able to encode every one of these vectors in around 20 bytes. You have a whole, you have a word, uh, it's encoded by a vector, but that vector is encoded in 20 bytes, which is similar to five floating point numbers, which is incredibly small. And so we're able to index things like all of Wikipedia, depending on your settings in like 60 gigabytes or 100 gigabytes, which you could, for something of that scale, is certainly something you can handle. The way we, we get around that is we say, these vectors are trying to capture two elements for each of them. It's trying to capture the identity of the word. So if I say bank, I'd like to know that this vector is talking about that space, that part of the vocabulary and the context. And so the way we get around this is we say, if we have a bunch of good centroids in the space, like a bunch of representative vectors everywhere in the space, then each of our document vectors is nothing but the closest centroid plus a very small delta that sort of just like nudges the dimensions in the right direction. And those deltas could be as little as one bit for every vector dimension. So if we have 100 vector dimensions, that's just 100 bits, um, plus the index of the closest centroid. And that works really well. Like it basically preserves the quality of the full representation, which was already a bunch of small dimension vectors. And with that, the overall storage of Colbert is similar to taking a single vector representation that you wouldn't necessarily compress for various reasons in a similar size. Obviously, the space is very rich, so you could always ask, if I have a single vector representation, what if I compress that? And there's a bunch of research on that too. So it's a, it's a very rich trade of space. So, so this might be, of a, might be somewhat of a small tangent, but in, in the Colbert V2 paper, you introduced a new data set, and I, I don't know if we call it the acronym, but I'll call it the LATTE data set, L-O-T-T-E. So like, why was yeah. using that data set imp important? And what does it say about like other data sets that are needed to solve the real world applicability of, of this research? Or benchmarking. What does it say about benchmarking in this space in general? Yeah, there you go. I'm personally very proud of the name, actually both names, but latte is a play on words on, on beer. So this is another benchmark in, in IR. And what latte focuses on is our observation that there hasn't really been, so Latte, I should add, Latte it was a concurrent project with Beer, and we named it after Beer was released. So in, in Colbert V2, we evaluate basically in-domain and out-of-domain. So in-domain, which is within the training distribution, we evaluate on the MS Marco data set. So that's a bunch of Bing queries on a small kind of snapshot of the web that they released, which actually has been an incredible resource for IR over the past few years. And out of domain is, which is really our focus in Colbert V2 is how well can these models that we're training work in settings that you did not train them for and mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to adapt them for. You just get the model, you essentially 
throw the problem at it and see how well it can do. So our intuition in Latte was that we wanted something that focuses on long tail question answering. Basically asking, if you look at, if you look at MS Marco or like popular things out there, like natural questions or others, they tend to revolve around popular actors or politicians or right. events, which is important. You want to be able to, in general, deal with popular head entities as they're called. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we wanted to tackle was, hey, there's a bunch of questions that are quite technical in say like the stack exchange for bicycles or yeah. some other stuff. And I tend to find some of those relevant sometimes. And we want systems that can basically answer search queries over these distributions. So that's what Latte is doing, is testing for. One key thing in Latte is that we actually uh, made an explicit distinction between having a dev set that is out of distribution and a test set that is out of distribution, which is something that didn't exist in IR before. So what that gives us and others is a way to track your progress on out of distribution domains without having any risk of overfitting on the test stuff that you're going to use once you're done building your models and systems. That's very cool. Well, it, 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 and this is a, somewhere Sorry. common on this, but like, this is important because it mirrors the context in which information retrieval will typically be applied, which is I've got my enterprise data set, which is not Wikipedia, some question answer pair of Wikipedia, which isn't widely trained on. And so all these use cases will be long tail. So you have to have this, these long tail uh, comparisons. But yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sandy. Uh, no, I was about to make the same observation, basically. Like it makes it much more relevant in contexts which are not Wikipedia, for instance. <laughs> Drug discovery literature, or it could be like, exactly. It, it could be something much, much more specific, for instance. Awesome. I think we've, I don't know, Chase, do you feel like we've covered enough sort of the work around Colbert and maybe we can skip to talking about DSP or do you think that we have one or two other questions? Well, well, let's ask one more question and then we'll pretend it's the end of this podcast and we'll pretend that we're getting on to episode two. So final question, thinking about, thinking in the context of the practitioners who want to apply this technique, what is it that they need in either in terms of skills or are there any like remaining technological breakthroughs we need to like scale an enterprise environment that that we should discuss here have you given it thought <laughs> I, I actually i think there's a lot here but i don't have a good handle on the on what the question could you if you could rephrase that would help me yeah well, so, so we're, we're talking about practitioners who maybe want to leverage some of these some of this progress and the question is maybe what is left for them to do in the last mile to get this to work well for their use case? Is that fair? That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So Colbert is a retrieval model. And that's actually a very clean abstraction in the sense that you have a bunch of documents, you can index them, you get queries, you can find similar ones. There is a lot of work that we've done and others have done on a bunch of modular components of that. One is how do you adapt those encoders to new domains? So yes, you, we want them to work well zero shot, but can we make some progress on adapting them to, to domains? There, there is also questions on, and there are like things like language models could come in. There are also elements of, well, we're just talking about documents and queries, but who is producing those? So maybe you have a bunch of PDFs and that's what you want to work with. And maybe it's actually one PDF. So you just build one document and search over it. Like you basically need to think of the pipeline that is going to ingest those documents into whatever representation you have. So you got to think of chunking and splitting and elements like that. And there's a bunch of emerging libraries out there that, that focus on that. So that's well outside the scope uh, of what we're doing in Colbert. We're just giving you the, the representational engine. And those would be complementary back to the discussion that we had around modular sort of components of Colbert, basically. Exactly. So how do you define what's a document? How do you generate your queries? Is it coming from the user unchanged? Or are you maybe putting a language model in between that helps steer things? So these are really some of the key focuses there. And then, you know, each 
context has its own limitations. Maybe you're not able to use GPUs for whatever reason, and you do not want to use our custom infrastructure because, I don't know, you, you don't like it for some reason. So then you can start thinking of building your own modular thing. Although I would definitely suggest it's quite mature. It's been around for a while. Lots of people use it. It's used in production in a bunch of places. If you can use our stack, please do. I can't hear for some reason. On that point, actually, have you guys seen contributions into the open source from users who have think, thought about extending them, extending Colbert in interesting directions? We've had nice contributions from uh, collaborators at VMware. Rick Battle has contributed a bunch of cool things. I got to check our PR list to see who is doing what, but... But there is an active PR list. Yeah, there's the, Colbert is an active, actively maintained GitHub repo. Awesome.